Thank you, Haley, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we are going to be discussing our forecast and, and, and predictions for the PC market for, for 2023, but because that would be an extremely short webinar, we're going to expand a bit and we'll cover more context that I think will be helpful in assessing the PC market. First, I'd like to invite you all uh, to, to tell me what you think. You know, clearly PC revenues have already fallen and <coughs> we have reasons to expect they will continue to be lower than they were the last couple of very intense years. When do you expect PC revenues to return to growth? So um, our, our presenters today are myself. I'm, I'm a, a principal analyst actually in the tailored services practice. Uh, ben Carboneau, a, an analyst in the data uh, Team, as well as an analyst on the devices practice, and Alex Maxfield, Alec Maxfield, sorry, Alec, uh, a, a, a research analyst in the in the devices practice. We will be covering, as I said, context, our predictions, and then comments on other devices, which is exactly what we put into our agenda. So we'll move on. So let's go back ten years, and and I was. Uh, reminded of this by, by a Twitter post by, by Michael Dell, where he said 10 years ago, we were dead. The tablet was going to take us out. Look where we are now. So let's, let's review what was happening with tablets and why there were some legitimate concerns about erosion of the PC market. And there was some erosion of the PC market. They're portable, very portable, thin and light. They are instant on and fast when they're they're acting and that is what the user wants they want to take out their device and have it work a good battery life which meant they they lasted enough for most people most of the time and they had a good display a good display for viewing on your desk or on your lap and uh, tight and crisp and bright and and rendering colors good for entertainment and good for work and they had the, the touch screen, very familiar smartphone inter interface. It was easy to discover apps and use them. It was, it was all very exciting. And it was seen as a real threat to PCs. Now let's look at the PCs 10 years later after that threat. They're portable. They're as thin and light as you would like them to be. I'm not sure there's a lot of room to make them any, any thinner or lighter for that matter, but they don't have to be. They are pretty close to instant on and they are fast, even ones with less impressive CPUs because of the adoption of solid state drives. They have good battery life by the same definition, uh, long enough for what most people need most of the time. They have, for people who want it, a touch screen and that presents an easy UI. It's not a smartphone UI, it's, it's the Microsoft touch screen UI, but you can use a touchscreen on a PC. I'm not a big fan, but lots of people are. And they have great displays. And that means a good deal more on the PC because those displays carry over to uh, now 4K and sometimes two 4K monitors, allowing you to be in a real immersive product production environment. They are far more powerful, even when you put the same chip in them as, as, as Apple has done, simply in terms of getting work done, a PC, because of its flexibility, is a much more powerful productivity tool. And they have a more powerful UI. The, the, the mouse or touchpad combination gives you a great deal more, more control over the things you're doing. That is what we regard as a modern PC. This is, this is when you think back, that's quite an improvement. And there were some improvements in the, uh, the ecosystem as well that made the PC a much more effective and, and well-accepted tool for getting things done than it was 10 years ago. They are more reliable. That solid-state drive came in handy. Uh, you can be pretty sure your PC is going to work. The con connections were not largely a consequence of improvements in the PC itself, although they handled the the connectivity better than they did 10 years ago, the software improvements, but mainly a, an improvement in Wi-Fi where it's, its coverage is better, its speeds are better, 
all those things work better. And so you can have reliable, strong connections most of the time. Cloud storage was a separate thing. It wasn't the PC itself, but working from cloud storage, and by cloud storage here, I mean things like OneDrive and, and, and Google Drive, uh, and, and for them that, that like their Macs, uh, the, the iCloud storage, basically means you are not locked into your PC. You can have more than one PC. That released a lot of potential, especially in the pandemic. You can also switch from one PC to another more easily. You're not in this fenced area where all your data are and it's a burden and you're in charge of, of ensuring backup and things like that. That's a big difference for the PC. We had docs for the notebooks back 10 years ago and they worked extremely well. They were expensive and they were proprietary and uh, they, were, they were a little hard to use, a little uh, clunky. The new docs, the, the USB-C, uh, docs are amazing. You you take your uh, bog standard uh, notebook and you plug it into a, a common, often third party dock, and you've got everything. You've got more than one monitor if you want it, keyboard, mouse if you want it, speakers, etc. It makes for a thorough working environment that you can also fold up and put under your arm. It's no clunkiness here anymore. Then there's just some good news and bad news, which is they are long, longer lasting. Now that is obviously good news for users and good news in terms of the perceived value and, and willingness to invest in the PC, but obviously it has negative implications for, for revenue from PC or refresh cycles. That lengthening of the refresh cycle is what happens when products mature. Automobiles still Every quarter they report the average age of automobiles on the road, and every quarter they stretch out. It's a it's a a, a consequence of product maturity. The incremental improvements are relatively smaller uh, when measured against the the considerable capability of the of the device. All the the things that cause the device to get old and feel old have been eliminated, so they last a long time, and people are less inclined to to buy new ones unless there was a good re unless there's a good reason. And the upshot of all this, the improvements that the PCs made, including adopting the strengths of the of the learning from tablets basically, have made the PCs more respected. They are seen as an essential business and home tool. And we even saw that when uh, children with home learning at, at, in the early grades were shifted at an earlier point from a uh, tablet device, typically an iPad, to a keyboard de device, uh, typically a, a, a Chromebook. People think this basic form factor for work and for user tasks that, that and for play somewhat, but, but, but for user tasks, is the right one. And I happen to agree. It's an essential tool. And this gives it a greater value. That is, it's, it's, it's got a greater status. People see it as more critical and more useful. And that does two things. One, they're willing to, to spend more for it to get a better one because they see it as something they, they need and, and, and work with all the time. And, and the other is they're actually willing to pay it because they see the, the benefit that having a PC and having a better PC delivers. They are still somewhat commoditized. You can you can find an equivalent configuration from all the vendors at any at any given level, but they're not anywhere near as much of a commodity. And buyers will will express their preference for the design or the brand or or the ease of doing business or the attached devices or services with a willingness to to, to not not price shop right down to the last cent or dollar. The other essential, just to give it context in, in, a, in a, a home or working environment, is the smartphone. And the point here, and, and there's been very little effective synergy between smartphones and PCs, and that's okay, um, is that tablets are, are, are role players. And that doesn't mean they're gone in any way, shape, or form. They serve a role. But when you know resources are constrained, they are the thing not bought. Um, they still play a role with entertainment. They still play a role with with young children, and they do a lot of custom application work 
in mobile and portable environments. They're great platforms for dedicated use for, for, for computer-based applications. Then, now we were talking about 10 years ago, and now we've moved, zoomed into the last five years. We, we have what is basically uh, a modern PC, and I'll mention that in a, in a, in a, in a minute, and all of a sudden, uh, there's a CPU shortage. Uh, Intel was not able to meet its expectations and expectations that it set for its customers, and there was a shift in the market. Intel shifted its resources to higher end, higher end CPUs, and and PC vendors shift, shifted their resources to higher end PCs. There was less price competition for these fully modern PCs, and margins were good. It was this was good for businesses. Shortages often are. One didn't get the impression that the shortages were really critical and were preventing um, customers from getting PCs they absolutely needed, but they had to pay a bit more, which is good for business. It produced a better product mix because the PCs were more, were higher priced PCs and more uh, more valued. Uh, they were buyers were willing to uh, spend more in attached revenue, and you had uh, very little price competition or lower price competition. Uh, profits went up and margins went up. Then we got hit a little more than a year after the CPU shortage with the pandemic, and uh, there was some question about what would be, you know, there were enormous questions about what the implications of the pandemic would be, but relatively quickly it became clear that people needed more PCs. So we had a, we had a shortage, and there were some problems in the supply chain, but the shortage was demand-driven. When you look at the units produced over the pandemic years, they are considerably higher than the units produced uh, prior to that point. And that is the way supply chains are designed. They're intended to, to uh, have some flexibility for, for greater production, but they have a limit. It's expensive to overbuild the supply chain. So while there were hiccups in, in, in factory uh, utilization, in logistics, the shortage came out of the greater demand and basically a backlog grew. This, you know, under a shortage situation, you have high margins and high revenue. You have higher revenue because of a, a similar shift to what I, I mentioned in terms of higher end PCs and higher attached and, and high margins because there's no price competition. People are willing to spend more for their more expensive PC. They're also willing to spend more because they're sitting in, in a location that's not your usual business location, trying to do all those business things. So um, monitors, um, speakers, uh, mouse, mice, keyboards, even chairs uh, became a part of the picture, as did more extensive services. You're in a critical situation. You need to keep your PC up and running, and you don't have your usual IT organization uh, down the down the corridor. You started to buy more services as well. There were ho some higher costs. Some came out of the logistics. Some came out of the supply, but the market was compliant. They would they would pay the price that was necessary. And bear in mind the prices that they're paying, which are higher than what we remember are quite low compared with what PC prices were decades ago. PCs had, you know, hit a very uh, aggressive price point because of their scale. And you're, in terms of business expenses, even at the high end, you're talking about a relatively modest investment. Supply, the, 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 uh, the demand slowed but um, the supply constraints extended the, the boom. So we had a backlog, the backlogs remained. And so even when first the consumer market fell out and then uh, the, the commercial market subsided a bit, you still had your margins. They, they, they had some hit, but they were still considerably high because you, you still couldn't get your PC immediately. But when the supply caught up, when basically you could get a PC when you ask for them, the backlogs evaporated, or maybe that's reversed. When the backlogs evaporated, the supply had caught up and revenue fell and seems to 
look like it's going to continue to fall going forward if you take Microsoft's numbers as, as an indication. So let me hand it off to, to uh, the, 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 the first of my colleagues. And I believe I'm right that Alec took this, this slide. So if I'm right, Alec, pick it up. If I'm wrong, Ben, you tell me I'm wrong. Go ahead. You're absolutely right. It was me. Um, hi, everybody. My name's Alec. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, I'm a research analyst in the uh, devices practice. Um, so just to dial back into this upcoming year, um, in terms of our major predictions for the devices uh, industry, the first thing that we're going to predict um, is that PC revenue is going to shrink um, based on a couple of different factors going on. Um, the first of these and kind of the major driving force um, is going to be market saturation. Um, so the first kind of, you know, aspect of that uh, and the dimension of this saturation, it comes out of the fact that um, because of the demand that ramped up during the pandemic, um, the total available market for PCs has expanded uh, because of increased utilization where people are using more PCs for things like remote or hybrid work, uh, for online school, for gaming, entertainment, et cetera. Um, so most of the people that either discovered or developed a need for a PC over the past three years um, have already bought one, which has contributed to this sort of market saturation. Um, and then Oops. the next part Sorry. of that is that, yeah. Um, yeah, Ezra? I, I apologize, you want the next click too, okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah, um, so another aspect is that um, you're good. Um, because so many users are running relatively new machines, um, there's very little need for them to be replacing them in the immediate future, um, which is going to kind of cut off some revenue opportunities. And then all of this um, is really kind of exacerbated by the fact that um, as computers get more and more advanced and then the rate at which that technology is advancing starts to slow down. So, you know, the next model of computer isn't leaps and bounds ahead of the one that people may already have. Um, that sort of margin between the features on current PCs and recent ones coming out um, becomes thinner and thinner. Um, which, make, which makes it harder and harder to justify the, you know, cost and inconvenience of replacing their current machine, which is just going to contribute more to that uh, market saturation and sort of a stagnation on people um, upgrading PCs. Um, and then on the flip side of that, so this is going to be mitigated by a couple of different things. Um, one of these, um, as Ezra sort of touched on, is that shift towards uh, higher end PCs that's happening in the market. Um, which, you know, drives higher prices as well as sort of um, avoids a lot of that really rampant price competition um, going on in those sort of lower end uh, markets. And then um, we're also going to see less impacts on the commercial market, um, as well as that um, another thing that Ezra sort of brought up, which was the kind of increased prevalence of these value adding um, attached services. Um, yeah, and then with that, I'm going to send it back to Ben. Thanks. I'll click over. There we go. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, yeah, sorry. Just to wrap that all up and bring that all back together. So with all of that in mind, um, we're looking at about a 10% decline in PC revenue, uh, assuming that the global economy doesn't enter into a recession in the upcoming year. Um, if that does happen, the way that we're sort of picturing that situation going down is that users are going to be even more likely to de delay refreshing those PCs, um, which is just going to further kind of shrink um, the available market and cut off revenue opportunities. And then also, uh, if companies end up shrinking during that recession and those their PCs end up back on the market as sort of um, lightly used or refurbished models, um, more cost-savvy buyers are going to be able to take advantage of um, those lower prices um, to pick those up and sort of cut the vendor out of that picture entirely, which is just going to, um, you know, cut off revenue opportunities even more. Um, so all of that said, under those conditions, uh, we're looking at something closer to a 20% reduction in PC revenue, um, which is a figure that might climb even higher depending on the severity of the recession. Great, thanks for that, uh, Alec. 
This is uh, Ben Carbono speaking now. I'm an analyst uh, with the data team and devices at TBR, and I'll present our second prediction for the PC market in 2023, and that is that increased levels of price competition will erode PC margins. Really, this is a result of supply outpacing demand. So I know Ezra touched on this, um, that CPU shortage that kind of bared its head in 4Q18. Um, and then as we all know, in 2020 with the onset of the pandemic, there was a lot of supply constraints. That was really leading up to, um, that really led to supply chasing demand basically since 2018 and that CPU shortage. But in the second half of 2022, we saw supply catch up to and actually exceed demand, which was evidenced again, as I just said, by those backlogs and those elevated inventory levels across the industry. But how did this all happen? I kind of want to do a cross-sectional breakdown um, and go over a few points in how we got to where we are today. So cross-sectionally, I want to break it down by supply and demand side factors and then where we were for the last few years um, compared to where we are now at the present. So where we were, we know, um, I think Ezra had said this, that there had been a pre-pandemic trend and it certainly um, persists that demand is decreasing for low and mid-range PCs. Really, that's a function of the increased useful life of PCs, kind of attributable to the advent of SSDs, better battery technology. Um, and then we also know that the pandemic increased demand um, for several reasons that Ezra already stated. Uh, we do know that the shortage was really demand driven. However, there are some supply factors that actually, um, you know, really intensified things. So first off, vendors didn't forecast that influx in pandemic demand. So they didn't have enough supply to meet that demand, um, which is reasonable. I mean, we saw a lot of um, poor, I wouldn't say poor demand forecasting, but inaccurate demand forecasting during the pandemic, just because it was kind of a once in a generation thing that happened and companies didn't really know how um, markets were gonna react. So those vendors did not um, prepare for that influx in demand. And again, this is intensified by the component shortages relative to demand, right? So demand went up, the, there, was, there was too few um, components um, during the beginning of the pandemic and also logistic constraints. A lot of that has to do with, you know, lockdowns around the world. And then I guess moving on since the beginning of the pandemic, we know that a lot of those components and assembly of PCs happens in China and they kind of had um, lockdowns that were, went longer than, uh, than in other countries. So where are we now? Presently, we see component availability improving. That means vendors are converting their in-process inventory to finished goods. And then on the demand side, we actually see demand kind of slumping. This has to do with that accelerated upgrade cycle during the pandemic, and then also, you know, longer device lifespan, right? So bringing it back to economics 101 here, we know that when supply is greater than demand, the prices need to come down. So that's really where these increased levels of price competition are coming from. Now I will talk about some mitigating factors similar to um, what Alex shared. So the first mitigating factor is a premium mix shift. So we see vendors, um, you know, including the big three. I mean, Apple is always catered to the premium market, but we see definitely the big three and other Windows vendors like Asus and Acer, you know, shifting their focus to cater to the premium end of the market, which we know is less price elastic, right? So they're less sensitive to increases in prices. And also um, vendors realize that like a better correlation between increased attach of services and peripherals on premium devices than mid and low range um, offerings. That's the first mitigating factor. And then kind of piggybacking off that second mitigating factor, increased attach. So we've seen this, um, across the industry for a couple of years now is vendors expanding their services portfolios. So really services was mainly services, PC services revenue was mainly derived from support and maintenance, kind of like break fix, extend warranty and things like that, which is still um, a big portion of PC services revenue. However, now you see vendors expanding their services portfolios with devices or service offerings. Um, definitely something that's really popular with just the different consumption methods, pricing, um, the economics behind it really, I think will prove strong during the pandemic when 
organizations are really cautious about their CapEx spending. Additionally, you know, vendors are always um, trying to push their peripherals attach. Again, peripherals attach generally higher on more premium devices. The third mitigating factor I'd like to go over is deflationary component costs. So as supply conditions have improved, uh, component costs have decreased. Most notably, the price of memory has decreased significantly. And additionally, there has been lower logistics costs. And part of that is due to, you know, less um, lockdowns. So there's more there's more logistic work, workers available um, in the workforce. But also, um, now that the supply conditions have improved, vendors can better predict their logistical needs. Um, I want to say that Dell mentioned this in one of their most recent earnings calls, but it makes it easier for a vendor to forecast what its shipments are going to be in the next quarter. And when they book those shipments with the logistic company, it um, generally is at a lower cost the further out that they book, right? Uh, one thing to note here is, you know, vendors with higher turns on inventory like Dell are going to realize the cost savings of lower component costs more quickly than their big three peers, HP and Lenovo. And lastly, this is really only a margin factor when the prices are changing. So eventually logistics and components costs are going to normalize. And once that happens, there's really not going to be a margin. Uh, this isn't going to be a driver of margin change. Similarly, um, not being a driver to margin change, improvements in supply chain. So we saw that vendors increased the number of SKUs that they were carrying, mainly due to getting mismatched chipsets. So kind of going along with that component shortages piece that I spoke about earlier. Um, but now that the supply conditions have improved, we're seeing vendors reducing their SKUs. So as the vendors reduce their SKUs, um, they want to, they're really trying to minimize the amount of product components that they're using and also make, you know, make those minimized product components as interchangeable as possible to be used in different machines. Um, and then, like, like I said, kind of mentioned earlier when I flipped to this bullet is that it's really only a margin factor when the SKUs are being reduced and the components are being consolidated. Once that has all taken place, um, this really won't be a factor impacting margin. Lastly, for mitigating factors, I just want to touch on some other cost-reducing measures. I think this one was really interesting. Um, Lenovo, out of the big three, has always been more involved in kind of in-house design and manufacturing than its peers. But recently, we know from um, Lenovo earnings documents, internal information that we have that Lenovo is actually increasing its in-house design and manufacturing both on its um, both on the PC side of the business and their data side, data center side of the business. But um, this is just reducing their reliance on ODMs and will potentially boost margins in the long run. Additionally, it has implications on the company's supply chain. Um, if they bring that in-house design and manufacturing, they have a little bit more control over their own supply chain, which I think is something that vendors are really focused on as COVID and the pandemic really underscored the need for a resilient supply chain. The net result here is that we believe margins will fall from where they are today, but they won't fall to pre-2018 levels. And that's because, you know, that premium mix shift that we went over. And really also, I think it's really gonna be attributable to increased PC services revenue. So every quarter, pretty much we see more and more uh, PC services revenue contribution. So I think that's a trend that will increase, especially as DAS continues to gain momentum. Um, and with respect to price competition, we believe it will remain aggressive, definitely through 2023, probably into 2024. Uh, I'll be interested to see what the poll says for a return to revenue growth, but definitely as supply outpaces that demand because that demand got pushed up and with you know, a PC minimum lifespan of like three to five years now, uh, we'll definitely see, we'll definitely see um, pretty aggressive price competition going forward here. So now I will uh, throw it back to Ezra to present our final prediction for 2023. Thank you, Ben and, and, and Alec both. 
So what's next for the PC? We, we've got the modern PC. It's, it's a very complete product. How can it be improved? How can we drive refreshes? The single big thing that I think is that I think we're finally reaching a point where cellular connectivity, having a, a cell phone radio in your PC and having a, a line that you can use it staying connected all the time becomes a real possibility. A lot of the the uh, questions about this have revolved around 5G, but for most PC tasks, you don't really need 5G. And right now there's a, a, a cost premium for 5G radios. That will probably uh, subside. Uh, I've already seen a decrease in it. I think it'll, it'll subside going forward. But in that context, the, 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 the cost that has impeded this uh, until now is the additional line cost with the PC costing more, more highly respected, and with line costs being not all that high, uh, it, I believe that cellular connectivity will complete the modern PC. And the reasons for that are that um, you know, being always connected, not having to find the Wi-Fi, et cetera, makes it certainly more convenient. It provides for more security. You don't have the pro problems with people potentially spoofing Wi-Fi uh, uh, wi routers and things like that. And it just lends an air of professionalism when you're, when you're working out of the office. You don't have to spend a, a couple minutes getting, getting connected. So I think that is one thing that would complete the story for the PC. And beyond that, we have not seen a lot of utilization of the, the, the computational resources in a PC to do some of the things that you can do now with AI. Uh, there's a little bit, you can certainly access AI uh, driven applications through the web. Um, there's there are benefits that are coming to AI, you know, you can see it all, all around you, but on the PC itself, using the resources in the PC, there's very little. Uh, Lenovo has some privacy features relating to the screen and the camera that are, are uh, AI driven, and, and uh, HP has some technology they got in the acquisition of Poly to, to suppress uh, keyboard and other noises. But I expect, and I don't have the killer app here, because if I did, I would be working for the startup, uh, that, that uh, what we will see is, is increased utilization of, of, of PC resources to do the things that AI can do. The, my, my fantasy app is having that uh, Cortana dialogue uh, release productivity related, related things. Uh, I apologize, that was Alexa being inappropriate. We'll get into that in a second. Uh, so, uh, excuse me. Alexa, stop. Again, I apologize. Um, my fantasy app is, is, is to have the Cortana box respond to kind of productivity sorts of queries. What was the file I was working on uh, yesterday evening? What's the, what is the spreadsheet associated with this email? I believe there's real potential in there. I think we've kind of abandoned the progress in terms of personalized uh, natural text processing. I think there, there's a future in there, but it's certainly not gonna change the PC in the foreseeable future. The next, well, we thought we would share some of our opinions. I've got a couple of my own, and my colleagues will add theirs. The first is, as I said, smart speakers have peaked. That is reflected in, in, in Amazon's uh, layoffs, where it's reducing its investment in the, uh, the smart speaker, whose name will not be mentioned. Um, but uh, it's also reflected, I think, in basically finding the limits of the user interface. That, that dialogue doesn't work very well beyond what it's doing in a general consumer environment. That natural language processing is still going forward very much inside applications and other environments where it's more constrained and I think has an enormous feature in querying. But the, the object that you put in your home and talk to uh, is, will grow not, not significantly 
in the, in the foreseeable future. Um, and I think we've reached a point where we can say that AR and VR have a role or have roles in, in, in things like gaming and, and, and field service and, and training, but they are not transformative, will change the whole computing picture kinds of, of technologies. So I will hand it off. Who, who's got smartwatches? Speak up, I'm sorry. That is me. All right. So my opinion here is that smartwatches will continue to permeate the market. So we know that uh, Apple Apple's uh, first watch was released in 2015. And as we see um, in their earnings releases and transcripts that they're continuing to grow in popularity and the install based is continuing to grow, both with new users and with upgrades. Um, other companies like Samsung and Google also come out with their own watch offerings, Galaxy Watch and the Pixel Watch. Um, again, just mimicking that success that Apple has had um, with the smartwatch. Going forward, I really think the driver of sales here is going to be health and fitness features. So you always hear Apple. I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen the commercials, um, but you know, there, now we're recording blood oxygen, been recording heart rate, um, any new features like that. So. I believe that one thing they're exploring right now is um, blood sugar measurements and then also blood pressure. So not sure how they're going to do that, but definitely those will be drivers of sales and of differentiation across the smartwatch market. Additionally, aesthetics. Um, as somebody who upgraded from a Series 3 Apple Watch to a Series 8 very recently, um, aesthetics were a big part of it. So the larger screen um, and then like things like always on display. So features, uh, kind of aesthetic features like that too. Um, I think we'll also see, you know, the shapes of the watches. You know, some of the watches are circular in shape, while others are rectangular. That may be a uh, driver of sales and differentiation going forward. But um, yeah, I really just do think that smart watches will continue to uh, permeate that smart devices market and continue to grow in the in the mix of revenue that they they contribute to that overall smart devices segment. And then, obviously, it's, it's, it's going to be Alec picking up the last one. Yeah, absolutely. So the last thing that we're kind of looking at is a trend that um, was really ramping up during 2022, and we expect to continue into 2023, is the sort of growing workplace solutions um, market. So we expect there to be a lot of movement there next year. Um, this is going to be based off things like uh, HP Inc.'s acquisition of Poly, which was finalized in August, um, which is going to drive a lot of that sort of um, go-to-market um, initiatives towards sort of integrating their um, workplace solutions uh, technology um, and sort of creating more of a uh, market for that. And then there's also uh, another player there is going to be um, Lenovo put out um, the Glasses T1 uh, wearable display, uh, which is going to be kind of marketed towards the intersection of kind of like hybrid and remote work as well as gaming and entertainment. So um, the full workplace solution thing, it kind of can also come off the um, shift to more premium offerings. Um, and we're expecting there to be quite a lot of movement in this um, sort of growing market in the next year. Thank you, Alec, and thank you all. That that concludes our, our, our presentation. Um, we would like to ask you to um, use the the question uh, facility in your in your user interface to 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 uh, to raise questions. We have one. Um, I will address it uh, a bit. I can and, I can and, feel and, that. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I want to say this because uh, it's a it's a it's a thinker. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead popped up. I believe this question popped up when I was presenting earlier on uh, on just that the, the deflationary component costs. So the question here um, is, please provide more context to that comment that Dell will have lower component costs than HP and Lenovo. So I'm not sure that that is a true statement there. Um, potentially, it is. Um, in these, in these, in maybe in this quarter and last quarter, but really what I was saying is that it has to do with the inventory, the the realization of the cost savings on the deflationary components has to do with the company's turns on inventory. 
So just calculating turns on inventory off of the balance sheets of the big three players, so Dell, HP, and Lenovo. And for those of you who don't know, turn on inventory is just the, the rate that inventory is sold, used or replaced. Um, we know that we know that uh, Dell has about twice the turns on inventory that HP and Lenovo has. Is in there they're replacing that inventory stock. That stock is either being sold, used, or replaced twice as fast as HP or Lenovo, meaning that they're going to replenish that stock earlier than HP and Lenovo, taking advantage of those cost savings on the lower component costs. And really, that's just a function of Dell's model, where they're, they hold a lower inventory than an HP or a Lenovo. And a lot of that has to do with their direct sales strategy and how they um, you know, leverage the channel a little bit less than their, their really channel-friendly um, peers, HP and Lenovo. Ah, and I don't know if Ezra, you want to add anything to that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still scratching my head. I mean, the, the net effect of, of more turns is that each PC spends less time in inventory. What that means in terms of netting the benefit because of declining uh, component prices, I'm a little, I, I'd have to do. I'd have to simulate it to, to answer that question. But it's it's certainly worth worth considering. Um, we have another question, which what what's next for desktop PCs? I think pet desktop PCs stabilize. I you know I think they they they've already they were doing it before the, all this disruption, and they're going to they will find a place at a uh, a relatively low percentage of of units for places where the desktop is what you want. So what you want for a desktop um, in in a typical business environment is where people are working at a, at a fixed location and maybe even people other people are handling the same are using the same workstation at different times it, it you know it, it's for a non-movable pc it may be better secured it's there's often a cost benefit associated with desktops but that has declined a great deal you you know the the price difference is not great i mean this is a part obviously from uh, workstations and gaming PCs, where the desktop uh, form factor is 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 part of the of the device attribute as well. In the home, the desktop has been a low priced and often shared device. Um, it probably after the pandemics will be a while before that that role is is revived. But I think you end up with desktop being the specific solution to specific situations, and the notebook because you get as generally pretty much close to as much uh, power and benefit for the same price as some differences. And because the docking is so easy, uh, becomes by, an, by, by far the dominant four factor, form factor. Are there any recommend, another question, are there any recommendations on innovative buying models for enterprises looking to buy PCs in uh, 20, 23 and 24. Um, I'm not sure it's innovative, but I would certainly be looking at the refurb market. Um, it, you know, if you are in a price constrained situation, um, the other thing you can you can do is look for better deals as as vendors are looking to ensure uh, a, a revenue stream in in times of of disruption. I think that. DAS is a great solution for for some buyers. Um, I'm not sure if you would consider that that at this point to be innovative, but uh, I think I think DAS is will continue to increase and will become a common but not dominant buying models for businesses that uh, prefer the as a service model. There's lots of reasons to do it. It takes care of of the service servicing and upgrading and disposal and a lot of things like that. Um, let me see if there are any other questions. I do have a scroll bar on my question list now. Nice, but I think I have answered all the questions. We, ah, here's another question. Okay, how are PCs gaining traction as as edge to compute devices? What are the dominant form factors here? 
Well, that's that's an interesting question. So uh, many companies, including the major PC vendors, refer to the PC as a, an edge device. It is on the edge of the network. And when we use the term edge, we have to say on the edge of what? Because the, uh, the, the communication service providers treat it as the edge of their network, which is not of terribly great interest to buyers. Um, but they're not generic connections for IoT devices where the term edge came up. There are IoT devices that are essentially PCs under the skin um, because they do a lot of similar things. But apart from being managed as an edge device, often have data stored centrally as coming off an edge device, they're not really what customers think of as edge devices. I mean, you, you might end up with what is a PC and edge device clothing that is an edge device, but the, the PC itself is, is a, even, even a desktop one, is a form factor for ongoing user interaction, not as a, an IoT device. Uh, one last call on questions. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Alec and Ben. And uh, I look forward to talking with you at another time. We have uh, uh, webinars and other subjects coming up uh, going forward. And please uh, stay aware of, of, of what we have to share with you. Thank you all very much.